Hello and welcome to the Deep Sea Podcast, Pressurized, a short, punchy version of our main feed that gets right to the scientific point. If you like what you hear and you'd like to hear the full episode, you can find it in the same feed. And now, to get right to the point. Should we dive into some news? All right, so we're looking at the good and the bad and the ugly then. So the good is vulnerable deep sea ecosystems get further protection from bottom fishing in EU waters, and that is like sea mounts and coral reefs and things like that. The bad is that deep sea mining looks like the tests at least have been given a green light to go ahead to do a, a trial in the Clarion Clipperton zone in the eastern Pacific. And the ugly is the UN Ocean Treaty has failed again. Nobody seems to be able to agree on stuff. Well, both the treaty and the bottom protection has been hovering for a long time. Was this the fifth time we've discussed the Ocean Treaty? Probably, yeah. Which would really change the shape of things. So even in the area, international waters, you'd still need to do a survey and do environmental monitoring if you were going to do anything, which at the moment is it's pretty open out there. Is it time to talk about unidentified spiky blue goo? Go for it. So during Noah's live streaming or dive streaming from the Akinoa Explorer, there was a mysterious blue thing spotted near the US Virgin Islands between about 400 and 600 meters deep. And researchers on board and on the live feed were uh, arguing over whether it could be a, a soft coral or a sponge or potentially a tunicate. So like a sea squirt, which I think was the first thing that jumped out to me. It looked a bit sea squirty, but the, the opening seemed to be really small. I have no idea. There's like nothing to go on. You thought maybe a closed anemone, like the beadlet anemone is that you get on the beach. But there's no opening, is there? Uh, and now that I see the flat one, I don't know. I don't know what that is. I assume it's some sort of spongy, corally type of thing, because that's the two groups that spring to mind when you start seeing weird objects that have no form or, or any sort of regular symmetry to it. It's just bizarre. This is not really deep sea. Did you see what happened in Tasmania two days ago? No. 200 and something pilot whales washed up. Oh, yes. They managed to save about 35, and now they've just got 100 and something or other. Dead whales. Carcasses lying on the beach. It's pretty horrific. Are they still considered a um, toxicity issue? Because heavy metals bioaccumulate so much in them. Well, they were saying they had one there recently, last year or the year before or something like that, and they, and they kind of figured out how to bury them or drag them out of deep water or something like that. But there has been cases where they just leave it to break down naturally. But when you have 200 to two and a half ton whales mm. all just lined up on one beach, they're like, we can't leave this. Anyone who's worked with them, there's a very special smell to a dead cetacean, to a dead whale or dolphin. The sort of rancid fat, it's like that beach is not going to be smelling good. Yeah, all that blubber. But what about you, Alan? What news can you share from your last adventure? Oh, lots. So we did a imaginatively titled Japan 1 and Japan 2 expedition. So I did the first month and then other people came on. So we swapped out and they did the second month. And we worked with a bunch of Japanese scientists from three or four institutes around Japan. First dive, myself and Mr. Viscovo went down to 7,300, whatever it was, meters in the Ruku Trench. It's also known as Nancy Shoto Trench. It's a weird one. We did the dive. It was actually very, very cool. Landers picked up a whole population of snailfish, which is interesting because that trench is pretty well isolated from all the other ones. The dive itself had one of the most conspicuous things, I thought, was quite a lot of metal objects, like paint cans. But wherever there was an old metal object on the seafloor, Downstream of that, there was a big patch of xenophyophores. Mm. And I was like, what the hell is this? Why are they always like a, associated with a bit of metal? And the Japanese guy I was working with happens to be a world authority on xenophyophores, which is Hiroshi Kitazato. And he was like, when they're building their test, when they're, when they're basically bulking up, they're scavenging the iron particles coming off the rust for ballast, which is what keeps them on the seafloor. So whenever you get a rusty object on the bottom, the chances are there'll be a pile of xenos next to it. That's incredible. I think we've spoken about them before, but just because it's a weird name, the xenophyophores, they're technically a single cell, yeah. but they've got multiple nuclei. Really unusual animals. So yeah, very cool that they're harvesting iron as ballast. Yeah, and like these things can't get any weirder, but apparently they do. Anyway, so that dive was cool. Then we went four or five days steam across east to the Aizu Ogasawara Trench. And first dive I did there was the deepest point in the southern end. And we put down a guy called Katsu, who's a geologist from Japan. He's now the deepest diving Japanese guy of all time, if you don't know that kind of thing. But he's studied that trench for, for like 20 years. So that was a really cool dive too. And they had these giant thick stocks and eminies on the bottom, which I've never seen before. That was kind of interesting. And we did a ton of landers there as well picked up a different type of well actually two snailfish there, there is a population of snailfish in that trench which as we know could be the japanese snailfish that we know of or it could be the mariana snailfish we know of because this trench joins the two together and there's no corridor between it so if it is one of the other two why is it linked with one of them and not the other mm. or is it a third species it's probably a third one i would have thought 
But in amongst all that, there was this big blue wrinkly one, which I've never seen anything like that before. They're never any more than one at a time, maybe occasionally two, but compared to the other one where you get maybe up to 20. So again, that was kind of cool. And then we went north to the Triple Junction. And it's a place called the Boso Triple Junction, and it's where the Eurasian, Pacific, and Philippine plates all meet. I think it's one of only two places in the world where you've got three tectonic plates fighting for dominance. And as a result of that, you end up with a really gnarly feature. And it happens to be 9,200 metres or something at the bottom. The only information from there is a paper written in 2009, I think it was, maybe even earlier, that there are crinoids, which are sea lilies, which come up in fossil records quite a lot. But there's supposed to be a crinoid meadow at the bottom of this. And they call it a meadow because it's supposed to be hundreds. Normally for crinoids, we normally see one or two if there's lots of hard substrate, but never hundreds or thousands. Myself and pilot called Chris May, we jumped in the sub. We went down, we were having a great old time, but close to 9,000 metres. Certainly when they're a few hundred metres at the bottom and the sub started to make some funny noises and there was a noise that we didn't like. So unfortunately we aborted, we pushed the button, dropped the weights, came back up and spent a couple of days scratching our chins trying to work out what that was. And it was a really interesting experience because I've, I've been many an aborted dive and this was by no means the most violent or weirdest one. It was one of those ones where you hear something and the part of your brain connected to your ears just goes on fire. Because you can't see outside the sub, right? So your vision's useless. You can't smell outside the sub. So it was weird. It's just that you've got such a heightened sense of hearing. Because the sub makes loads of noises because it compresses on the way down. So it does make snappy noises and cracking noises when the foam, the buoyancy starts to expand and contract and so on. But this was different. This was like, what was that? That didn't sound good. And yeah, and so we bailed him. I'm not entirely sure where it was. But uh, we think we, we knew what it was and it was something relatively minor, but something relatively minor or a small air cavity that might have imploded doesn't sound like a big deal. But when you've got 900 bar behind it, it probably does make pretty big noise. So anyway, so we build over a Japan Trench. We put Hiroshi down to deepest point, 8,000 meters. He was pretty happy about that. The cool thing with the Japan Trench was bent thick tinophores. They look like normal tinophores. They've got the two big tendrils. They look like the ones that normally float around, but they're holding out on the rocks. And they were everywhere, all over the Japan Trench. Not in the other two trenches, which is kind of cool. That was very interesting. Oh, wow. So then eventually after that, because we did the 8,000 meter dive because it was shallower than the depth in which we started hearing funny noises. So we've, Chris and I decided to strap a pair on and get back on the horse and we went back south again to the triple junction we're doing at this time we think we knew where it was and so we went down to 9,150 meters and it was absolutely unbelievably cool i mean these crinoids are bright yellow and there were hundreds of thousands of these things it was just mesmerizing it was like driving around in a garden the geology was mental at one point we're sitting in what looked like the steps of a mayan temple but he's trying to describe the form yeah so a mayan temple would be like that sort of steepness and it, it was piling up and loosely described as steps if you like so you're trying to describe what the terrain in front of the sub looks like and what was cool is i kind of forgot that the species that was named after me like 10 years ago the jameson i i found that in that trench oh wow i got to see it alive so that was quite nice that was a nice little sort of touch by the end of Japan 1, we'd mapped 62,000 kilometers of seafloor, 34 landers. And then I, I came off, I put my guys on, and they brought that up to 62 landers. And they were concentrating around the 2011 earthquake site. And it's just mental. Really? Utterly mental, what that earthquake did to the seafloor. I mean, it's just cracks and canyons and gullies. and But it's, it's amazing you see how it's been repopulated. And you've got a fixed time scale. You know when those areas were recolonized, it's going to be really useful for deep sea colonization. Yeah, so all in all, pretty amazing. I think in total we mapped somewhere between 70 and 80,000 square kilometers of seafloor. And I heard a rumor, I'm not sure, I need, I need to validate this, but apparently by next year, when we talk about the percentage of the oceans that's been mapped by multi-beam, the pressure drop alone will count for one whole percent of that. So you're approaching Solo, the little factoid that used to always be spun out. Yeah, I really, really, really liked it. I thought it was just a really cool trip. Yeah, there's a whole other side to these operations that we don't hear about that often. But there's a forgotten element to this whole industry is these invisible people on the ship who are actually there spending months and months and months of the year at sea supporting the acquisition of scientific data, even though they're not scientists. And that, is, that is the crew. That's the captains and the crew. They fall into the shadow of the person who's telling the story. And that, in our case, tends to be the, either the person in the sub or the scientist or whoever it is. And we don't want the rest of them to be forgotten because what they're doing is absolutely brilliant. They're holding the whole thing together. So we should talk to the captain. Yeah, let's talk to the captains too. To get a captain's take on all things deep sea, there is only one man who can fill this month's slot on the podcast. He's a captain of many talents, a veteran of the oil and gas industry, currently known for being the man at the wheel of the DSSV pressure drop, 
He was also the captain of the Mermaid Sapphire on James Cameron's Mariana Trench Dive. And more importantly, he's a good friend and supporter of the science department. So it's my absolute pleasure to introduce to the Deep Sea Podcast, Captain Stuart Buckle. Hey, Stu. Hey, thank you very much for having me on. That's all right. So, right, first question, let's go back to the start of your submersible captain's career, right? So you were in command of the Mermaid Sapphire for Mr. Cameron's Dive, 2012. How do you get that gig? I mean, how do you become the first captain to deploy a full ocean depth sub for over 50 years? I would like to have some big dramatic story about how I was headhunted from afar. But in reality, it was just sheer blind luck and good fortune. The Mermaid Sapphire was between jobs in the Gulf of Thailand and James Cameron sent his recon party out to try and find a mothership and it just so happened that the Sapphire met all the requirements for cabin space, deck space, had a crane that was big enough to lift the sub and was available. So we were just sat in a little port called Rayong in Thailand and I had the director and a couple of technical guys from Cameron's company come down and have a look around. Turned out that I, I got very well with the sort of expedition leader there, Andrew White. We saw him it off straight away and although the ship wasn't perfect I sort of managed to explain how we could make it all work and they seemed to be taken with that and and the rest as they say is it's history. So what was that like did you get a sense at the time that that was quite a historic monumental thing to do because that was the first time anyone had been down to Mariana for like 50 years or was it just another job? To be honest not at all they were very secretive about what the actual plan was with Deep Sea Challenge they didn't even mention that name they just wanted to know about deck space and what weight the crane could lift what weather conditions I thought we could overboard things in it wasn't until three months later when we were just about to arrive into Sydney that I started seeing drawings and diagrams of, of what was being planned and then Jim came down when we arrived and we all sat down had a meeting and explained what the goals were and what it was we were trying to do and then it kind of became a big deal, if nothing else, because you've got the biggest movie director of all time sat in your office drinking coffee. So I remember you telling me a little bit of a, a nerve-wracking moment during the recovery of that sub on the big dive. Is it true that you couldn't find him? <laughs> Not strictly true. When he was on the surface, we could find him very easily, in fact, because that vehicle had AIS, which once he was on the surface, it meant we could see him on both radars and on the Ectus we had. So that was fine. The issue was that when he was below the surface, we had absolutely no idea where he was. Right. Uh, we had no tracking at all. So we just had to keep a long way away just in case he came up and hit the ship. And uh, the steel sphere was right on the bottom and the top section was all foam and batteries. So sort of the nightmare scenario would be that if he would come up and impact the ship, shatter all the foam and crush the batteries, and then he'd have no buoyancy and the little steel sphere would just go back down again and never come back. Ooh. So that was the kind of thing used to keep me up at night. People always say, you know, oh, we didn't really know you were there. We didn't know you were involved in that project. And I was like, no, I was quite happy not being high profile because that meant everything was going well and, and I was doing my job. You know, if I'd have been the one that killed James Cameron, I would have been very famous. I'm sure. So a number of years passed after the, the Cameron gig to get on the pressure boat. What did you do in between that? Did you just go back to oil and gas? Oh, with my head in my hands and then crawling back and lying in the fetal position for six months. The whole deep sea challenge thing was, was sold to me very much like a, a five deeps situation in that the plan was to take this incredible vehicle around the deepest parts of the world's oceans. Yeah. So this was incredibly exciting for me and, and all the team on board and we were all sort of really keyed up for that. But then unfortunately, the sort of driving force behind that, Andrew White, and to a certain extent, and Mike Degree, they both were uh, unfortunately killed in a helicopter crash. And the drive from everyone else involved kind of died with them. Oh, that's a shame. And, and that combined with the sub being not in a great condition when it came back from its last deep dive meant that it was just decided to shelve the project. And then I sort of had to go back to a, a very sort of mundane existence to me of, of sub sea construction and, and oil and gas, which was pretty soul destroying, to be honest, because I was very bought into the concept of exploration and to a certain extent, the science. We did do the science to the extent that we do now, but we had landers and we had cameras. We got some samples and done and although I'm a, a geek and I love technology and you know the engineering aspect of the sub is absolutely incredible what really grabbed me and what, what tends to grab everyone else long term is the science is the the seeing new species getting to explore places that, that no one's been before and that was really what captured my imagination and reignited my drive after being in oil and gas for sort of 15 years yeah it was very sort of just the day job. So it must have been cool getting that call about the pressure drop saying all that stuff that you didn't get to do. Oh, it was, We're on. It, was it was incredible. I had to wait like seven and a half years. But yeah, I was living in Glasgow at the time. It was like Friday evening and the phone went and it was Rob McCallum. And he was like, uh, I think I've got a job you're going to want to take. <laughs> I think when, when someone like Rob McCallum says that, you just say yes. <laughs> I didn't say what, I just said, when do you name me? So for for the benefit of the listeners who don't know, when the pressure drop used to be the MacArthur 2, so NOAA hydrographic vessel, before that it was 
the Indomitable, which is an old naval submarine hunter in the Cold War. So when Stu took command of it, it had been left sort of sitting in a yard somewhere for a while, eh? So it was like a full refit, repurpose, recrew. It was right from the bare bones up. So at the point that you took command of it, what were the biggest challenges in putting together this operation? The biggest challenge actually was was being brought in too late. It was a combination of having guys that weren't used to dealing with older, more agricultural equipment um, and other people just not having experience directly of of doing ship refits so they just didn't know the, the scope of what was required yeah. and because I was brought in later a lot of decisions had already been made that were probably the wrong decisions but it was too late to undo them so we, it was very much a case of do the best with what you've got and uh, yeah. the only way that I could do that was to bring in the best people I knew so the only sort of requirement I had with Victor was that if he wanted me to do it and for me to be successful I had to be able to handpick the team to come and work with me so um, a lot of that was down to attitude it wasn't necessarily qualification or they, they all had the qualifications but it wasn't like the best person in the field it was the one to roll the slaves up and charge at the problem head first especially when we're down in the southern ocean you can't just pick up the phone and ask for a service engineer you need someone to say right well this is the situation and we're gonna have to deal with it now it's funny because my next question was along those lines because you know i've heard it said many a time when people talk about captain buckle your biggest strength is to some degree people management so part one of my next question was like what i think makes pressure drop quite unique is actually the crew I and mean, there's a lot of mutual respect for one another between the individuals and departments so at the end of the day everyone sits down as mates and I find that rather unique and I was wondering what's your selection criteria for bringing on new crew or, or at least retaining the good guys you've got that's a really good question the majority of the guys and, and girls that came with me initially I'd, I'd worked with before they were sort of proven proven assets if you like for me with regards to, to new people coming through I always tend to either go with someone that I know personally or someone else who works with me who I already trust yeah. has worked with before and says they're good it's very difficult for someone to recommend someone to come work on board with them and with me because if they're not what they say they are then it's found out very quickly and everyone looks bad yeah so what that tends to do is filter it out and you tend to get people only recommending people that are actually you know top of the game and and, and people who will fit in yeah and it, it's funny you say about the atmosphere on board. I do have a sort of very informal management structure in the fact that all the guys that work for me know I'm the captain. I know I'm the captain. So I don't need to shout at them. They don't need to bow down to me. If I ask them to do something, they'll do it because I'm the captain. And I also expect them, if I ask them to do something silly or they think it's dangerous, then they'll question me and, and say why. But also, I also give them a lot of a lot of leeway and responsibility just to get on and run their own departments, run their own position. Yeah. It's that famous saying, right? Always hire people smarter than you. Yeah. And it's true, you know. I tend to think of myself more of like a manager. But it is quite unique that, you know, because I've, I've worked on, I don't know, about 20 or 30 different ships. And more often than not, there's big fractions within the ship's crew. You know, the officers sit at one table, deck crew sit at another table. They don't talk to each other. The galley staff hate everybody, you know, and it can be quite <laughs> a weird, like, microcosm of society. And uh, it often doesn't function because of that. And what I really love about pressure drop is that it doesn't exist. And part two of that question is one part of your job that I find really fascinating is that being in command of an isolated group of 45 people often from quite different backgrounds and spanning many many countries a big part of your job is a bit like a soap opera right so you know there's the mentoring and the pastoral care gossip control conflicts medical issues do you get taught that when you go for your master's ticket do they teach you the people management of running a ship not not really i mean in, in more recent years they've started teaching what they call the human element aspect to the job but they never did that when i was doing my master's i think i try and mentor the guys as much as possible because I had a couple of good mentors when I was a young officer but to be honest where you learn most is through sailing with bad captains you know I mean I've sailed with quite a few bad captains I've been very lucky to sail with a number of good ones yeah but it's the bad ones that you learn from. You just see how they treat people how, or how they treat you. Yeah. And you know, when, I, when I was coming up through the ranks, I was just like, do you know what? I'm never going to be like you. Yeah. And I'm going to try my hardest to be the opposite to you. And I'm going to try my hardest to make everyone I work with be the opposite to you so that that kind of gets stamped out within a generation, you know, because when I started back in the sort of mid 90s, there were still a lot of guys who started to see in the late 60s. Yeah. So there was a lot of generational issues there, just like there is in normal life with, you know, sexism, chauvinism, racism all these things that are not tolerated these days but it was a real issue with the old boys if it was you know so I've made a conscious effort throughout my career to try and change the direction of, of things for the better so going back to uh, the subs right so on this podcast we've talked a few times about the differences between for example being in the sub or doing it remotely the difference between being there or not being there 
right? So from your perspective, during subdives, you're obviously the man orchestrating it. And I think orchestrating is the right word, having seen you do this so often. <laughs> uh, you know, you're, you're trying to orchestrate all these different departments at the same time and everything else. But for you, I know you've done a lot of oil and gas stuff and big infrastructure stuff, and you've lifted stuff that's like hundreds of tons off of ships and all the rest of it. Is there a difference between an operation when you know there's somebody in that vehicle than if there's not? Or is it just a case of every operation is the same, you're just there to pick an item out of the sea and put it on the deck? Huge, huge difference, especially with someone you know. No, but I think I was exposed to that because I, I used to work on the dive support vessels, the, the deep sea saturation divers, yeah. where they live under pressure in chambers on board. And, and that's very much a high pressure environment when you're sat on the controls and you've got two guys working down at, you know, 200 meters, fixing things on the seafloor. And if you make a mistake, then you, you're looking at killing two or maybe three guys. Yeah. So I think I started doing that when I was you know, very young, sort of, you know, 20 years old and, and second officer. I was on the, on the controls for six hours a day for that. Wow. So I think that kind of conditions you for dealing with the stress of it all, but also understanding that every action you do has a consequence, which could be a massive consequence for someone else. So yes, it makes a huge difference. At the same time, I tend to spin it around that I'm helping my friends like you or my boss, like Victor, achieve their goals. So it's very much a, a positive thing. That's how I tend to look at it. So I added it up today as well. So go back to the old deep sea bit. Over four years, I think we've done 280 lander deployments, probably close to 6 million square kilometers of seafloor mapped, over 120 sub dives, visited every ocean. And with that in mind, what are the highlights for you? The funny thing is, lots of people ask me the same question. And for me, every dive site looks identical. Okay? It's just the open ocean. True. I mean, yes, <laughs> yes, the watercolor can be different. But <laughs> generally speaking, I'm floating around on the ocean with a couple of support craft, you know, buzzing around and a sub on the, on the seafloor. And that's it. People ask me that question all the time. And uh, I'm not really sure why. Thinking along those lines, I think back to there's some scientific highlights, which I won't bore you with. But in terms of the, the actual expedition type of stuff, I mean, it wasn't that, well, when was it? 2019, we're off in Antarctica and we, we came across an iceberg that was 28 miles long. Yeah. I mean, that for me stands out in all of that as being something truly exceptional moment of you parking a ship alongside a 28 mile long <laughs> iceberg and we're just sort of looking going, huh? Yeah. I mean, that's all bucket list stuff, right, as well? Yeah. Which is incredible, really. I mean, from a, like a, a sailor's perspective, you know, they used to get all the old tattoos. Yeah. You know, you get different ones across the Atlantic, across the equator. I mean, I don't have any tattoos, but if I did, I'd have a full set right now because the five deeps, you know, we went round the world twice to both poles, yep. crossed all the oceans, went through both canals, you know, Panama and Suez. Yeah, so you know, we've really got the bingo of bucket list trips for captains. Seeing huge tabular icebergs down south and then nudging the bow into the, the ice pack up north. Yeah, I consider myself very lucky to have been able to do that over the last few years. Well, I think one of the frustrating things about being a captain on a sub-support vessel is that you are critical to the entire operation and therefore, by default, you've never had the opportunity to dive in the sub. So we're going to try and rectify that at some point in the next couple of years. But if you were to get a dive, where would you go? Well, that's a very good question. I'm not bothered really about doing massive deep dives. I know exactly what you mean because we've done so many deepest points and quite often they're not particularly interesting other than the, being able to say you did the deepest point. I mean, I, I get there is scientific value in, in well, doing these transects. If I'm only going to do a couple of dives, I'd, I'd really like there to be something interesting to look out of the window. So yeah, somewhere where there's geologically interesting feature or lots of life or something interesting like a hydrothermal vent or even a wreck, you know. Yeah. Also, remember when we went to Johnston and the tracks in the seabed where it had sort of run down over the edge and fallen down into the deepest abyss? They looked like they were just made yesterday, which was really sort of shocking to me that it's like an 80-year-old event, but it looked like it had just happened yesterday. We talked about the impact on deep-sea mining. I think people don't understand the severity of, of, of all that stuff and how these big corporations are likely to ruin large areas of the seafloor. So I'd actually like to do a dive somewhere where they were planning on doing some mining and then visit it after afterwards and just see the before and after shots that'd be quite a cool thing you know it's funny i was thinking about this earlier about like what's a good stew buckle story what's a good captain pressure drop story and i was thinking of all the cool places we've been and actually the one that stands out believe it or not remember we came into london at the end for the big party <laughs> yeah, yeah. we came right up the thames right across from the millennium dome yeah that's right yeah pulled in there i think before we got off the ship they came and said you had to turn around and i was thinking you're in a key right you're in a dead end here and i was looking around going how's he going to get out of here can you reverse that far on a ship and you basically 
put it into the middle of the key and spun it 180. But it, you must have made it with like meters either end to spare. And that, again, when we talk about orchestration, just watching you turn a ship 180 degrees in such a ridiculously tight place, I, th- I was in awe of that. I was genuinely just up the top going, I don't know how we just did that. Do you know what? It, was, it wasn't easy, especially with some Americans on the bridge ring right beside me, screaming and hooting, hollering. Some other Americans on the <laughs> key side shouting, <laughs> Woo, go pressure drop, yeah, woo! And then, you know, and then I think uh, Don Walsh was there watching, which is a fair bit of pressure. Yep. And my dad was there and he's an ex-captain. He was there watching. There was a huge amount of people on board. So, you know, it was a... <laughs> It was quite a tricky maneuver on the best of times, but to have like a massive live studio audience all watching. Actually, the, the other tight parking spot, Dom was also there to watch me. He was leaving Woolloomooloo Navy Base in Sydney. But while we were parked in there, they kind of boxed us in with warships. And I said, okay, you, you can leave now. I'm like, are you going to move all the warships? They're like, no. So of course, again, I had Dom Walsh looking over my shoulder while I'm <laughs> maneuvering around all these warships. Yeah. And then Dom Walsh is like, he's driven more types of, of ships and subs than, than I've had hot dinners. Yeah. So speaking of Dom Walsh, I think I should say at this point, thanks very much, Stu, for coming on the Deep Sea Podcast and giving you a good friend, Dom Walsh. I think you should introduce Dom Walsh here. Okay. Allow me to introduce a very good friend and a hero of mine, Dom Walsh. Hello, this is Don Walsh, explorer and oceanographer. However, today I'm going to put on my retired U.S. Navy captain's hat and talk to you about the fine art of ship handling. I define it as simply skillful seamanship in situations where you're close into a, a dock, other ships, where there's the possibility of hitting something. The key is practice and lots of it. In order to make your ship do what you want it to do, You also have to take aboard other factors, such as the environment around the ship, and also in consideration or keep in mind the possibility of equipment failure, such as losing your steering or losing your propulsion power. The key is to simply stay ahead of the ship and anticipate all the what-ifs in case of something not going according to routine. I had good mentors in my early days of seagoing, and... uh, started out in a World War II designed cargo ship. It was slow, it was underpowered, and maneuvering it in close-in situations was quite a challenge. Next, I spent 14 years in submarines before getting my first command in the late 1960s. While my primary job was to carry out the missions that the Navy assigned to us, another major part of my job was to train the young submariners who eventually become ship captains on their own. At the time, I was a cigar smoker because on board the diesel submarines of that time, that era, there was always a lingering odor of diesel oil, other bodies, and cooking. So these were kind of like incense sticks to mask these other odors. And so when I was training my officers to handle a ship, I um, used to gauge their skills in the terms of cigars uh, used up during their landing attempts. A one cigar landing meant that that young officer was doing a pretty good job. If it got up to three or four, or if I bit one in two, then that's somebody that needed a lot of remedial training. And by the way, I was not smoking those cigars. I was just clamping down on them, like biting the bullet, so I didn't say anything until I thought the officer was getting into some trouble and I had to haul him back from the precipice. Some of my contemporary submarine captains like to kind of showboat, that is, make very flashy landings, of what we would call a one-bell landing. That would be all-back emergency. But if you didn't get that backing bell or something happened to your propulsion, then a great deal of chaos would ensue. I remember one case where I just gotten alongside the dock and another submarine was going to come alongside and moor next to me. Well, he came whistling in at a high speed and asked for his all-back emergency. He didn't get it, and he went right on past me and smashed into the, the Admiral's special boat. And that was not a happy time for either the Admiral or for that young submarine captain. This uh, validated my personal feeling that if you're really good in ship handling, no one will notice. But if you're bad, everybody sees it. And that's all for now. Thanks for listening. And that concludes this pressurized version of the Deep Sea Podcast. If you've enjoyed this episode and you'd like to go into some more detail, you can find the full episode in the feed. Just match the episode numbers. We'll deep see you next time, and I abyss you already.
The Deep Sea Podcast is supported by our company, Amatus Oceanic. If you'd like to explore the deep sea for yourself, we can provide the technology and know-how to allow you to do that. Or if you'd like to bring the deep sea to your audience through storytelling, fact-checking, or presentations, we can help with that as well. We want the deep sea to be accessible to everyone.